Newton Communicator Manual. And uh, her favorite singer happens to be Avril Lavigne. Lavigne. Many people you've heard about Avril Lavigne. Yeah. Some people have heard about Avril Lavigne. She says that it pets her up. And today she's going to be doing her reading from the book called Atlantis. Atlantis by Shruti Pandit. Good morning to one and all. Today I am going to attempt interpretive reading and uh, just to correct you Vijay, I am uh, going to attempt my interpretive reading from this book Atlas Shrugged and it's from part 3 as is and chapter name is Atlantis, chapter 1. So just before I start with my speech, I want to give you a brief background of the story that I am going to narrate, the plot and the characters involved in the story. So this book is about a businesswoman, Dagny Taggart and John Gant, and the conflict that happens between them. Dagny Taggart is supposed to be the owner of America's biggest transcontinental railways. She is the lady who runs the railway and she is owner of Taggart Transcontinental. She works with various business people, various stakeholders that keeps economy of America running. It's a fiction. And she works with best brains, best scientists, best philosophers, best miners, best power plant suppliers, and best of the best brains. So that's how economy runs. And suddenly, a silent destroyer steps in and everybody starts vanishing. Everybody starts going on a strike. And due to that, whole economy is brought to halt. And she is clueless. So she decides that she'll go ahead and she'll find out that who this destroyer is and where are all, every, where is everyone vanishing. So she stumbles in, the valley, in a valley in Colorado where she finds that all the best brains are present there and they are building their own world. The world that they have always thought of. The utopia, the heaven that they have dreamt of. The world that consists best of the best. And the story that I am going to re recite describes Dagny's meeting with these best of the best brains. So there's a party that happens at the best banker's place, Mida's Mulligan, and that's how the story unfolds. She meets whom, whom she had always dreamt of meeting. She had not met for four to five years, and she meets them after four to five years. She goes there with John Gant, who is hero of the story. So here starts my story. The floor, the floor of the valley was like a pool reflecting the glow of the sky. But the light was thickening from gold to copper. The shores were fading and the peaks were smoke blue. When they drove to the Mulligan's house, there was no trace of exhaustion left in her bearing and no remnant of violence. She had awakened at sundown. Stepping out of her room, she had found Galt waiting, sitting idly, motionless. In the light of a lamp, he had glanced up at her. She had stood in the doorway, her face composed, her hair smooth, her posture relaxed and confident. She had looked as she would look at the threshold of her office in the Tagard building but for the slight angle of her body, leaning on a cane. He had sat looking at her for a moment, and she had wondered why she had felt certain that this was the image that he was seeing. He was seeing the doorway at her office, as if it were the sight long imagined and long forbidden. She sat beside him in the car, feeling no desire to speak, knowing that neither of them could conceal the meaning of their silence. She watched a few lights come up in the distant homes of the valley, then lighted windows of Mulligan's house on the ledge ahead. She asked, Who will be there? Some of your friends, some of your last friends, he answered, and some of my first. Mida's Mulligan met them at the door. She noticed that his grin 
was a square face was not harshly expressionless as she had thought. He had a look of satisfaction. But satisfaction could not soften his features. It merely struck him like a flint, sent sparks of humor to glitter faintly in the corners of his eyes. A humor that was shrewder, more demanding, yet warmer than a smile. He opened the door of his house, moving his arm shade more slowly than normal, giving imperceptibly solemn emphasis to his gesture. Walking into the living room, she faced seven men who rose to their feet at her entrance. Gentlemen, Tega Transcontinental, said Midas Mulligan. He said it smiling, but only half jesting. Some quality in his voice made the name of the railroad sound as if it would have sounded in the days of Nat Tegard, Dagny's grandfather, as a sonorous title of honor. She inclined her head slowly in acknowledgement to the men before her, knowing that these were the men whose standards of value and honor were the same as her own. The men who recognized the glory of the title as she recognized it, knowing with a sudden stab of wistfulness how much she had longed for that recognition through all these years. Her eyes moved slowly. In greeting from face to face, Alice Wyatt, Ken Daniger, Hugh Axton, Dr. Hendricks, Quentin Daniels, Mulligan's voice pronounced the names of the last two. Richard Halley and Judge Narangas said. The faint smile on Richard Halley's face seemed to tell her that they had known each other for years. As in the lonely evenings by the side of a phonograph, they had. The austerity of Judge Narangas said white-haired figure reminded her that she has once heard him described as a marble statue. A blindfolded marble statue, it was a kind of figure that had vanished from the gold troops of America when gold coins had vanished from countries' hands. You have belonged here for a long time, Mr. Tegar, said Midas Mulligan. This was not the way we expected you to come here, but welcome home. No, she wanted to answer. But she said to herself, answering softly, Thank you. Dagny, how many years is this going to take to you to be learned to be yourself? It was Alice Wyatt, grasping her elbow, leading her to the chair, grinning at her look of helplessness at the struggle between a smile and tightening resistance in her face. Don't pretend that you don't understand us. You do. We never make assumptions, Mr. Garth said Luge Axton. That is the moral crime peculiar to our enemies. We don't tell, we show. We don't claim, we prove. It is not your obedience we seek to win, but your rational conviction. You have seen all the elements of our secret. The conclusion is now yours to draw. We can help to name it, but we can, but not to accept it. The sight the knowledge and the acceptance must be yours. I, I feel as if I know it, she answered simply. And more, I feel as if I've always known it, but never found it. And now I'm afraid, not afraid to hear it, just afraid that it's coming too close. Axton smiled. What does this look like to you, Dagny? He pointed at the room. This, she laughed, against the golden burst of sun rays filling great windows. This, this looks like, you know, I never hoped to see any of you again. I wondered at times how much I'd give just for one more glimpse or one more word. And now, and now this seems like a dream you imagined in your childhood. When you think that someday in heaven you will see those great departed whom you have not seen on earth. 
and you choose from all the past centuries the great men you would like to meet? Well, that's one clue to the nature of our secret, said Axton. Ask yourself whether the dream of heaven and greatness should be left waiting for us in our graves? Or whether it should be ours here and now on this earth? I know, she whispered. And if you had met those great men in heaven, asked Candaniga, what would you say to them? Just, just hello, I guess. That's not all, said Danigo. There's something you'd want to hear from them. I didn't know it either until I saw him for the first time and he pointed at God. And he said to me, and that was it, that was it that I knew what it was like. And he said to me, that was the first time I knew. She dropped her head and nodded silently and he said, well done. All right then, well done Dagny, well done. Too well and now it's time for you to rest from that burden which now none of us should ever have had to carry. Over to you Toastmaster of the Day. Thank you, Shubhi. I always wanted to read that book, but I was always put off by the fitness. <laughs> <laughs> I came to have 